The Acer Predator Triton 700 is a thin and powerful gaming laptop. It's been out for a while now, but it's still a great machine that a lot of you have requested I check out, so let's get started. Starting with the specs, my unit has an Intel i7-7700HQ CPU, so 4 cores, 8 threads, with a 3.8GHz single core turbo and 3.4GHz all core turbo boost. I've got 32GB of memory running at DDR4-2400 in dual channel. For the storage, it's got two M.2 drives, both with NVMe support. In my configuration, there are two 256GB SSDs in a RAID 0 array giving us fast speeds and 512GB of usable storage. No room for a 2.5 inch drive here though. For the graphics, there's an Nvidia 1080 Max-Q, a powerful laptop GPU. It's similar to a desktop 1080 in terms of CUDA cores and memory, but it's got a lower TDP and lower clock speeds. And it's this which powers the 15.6 inch 1080p 120Hz IPS panel. For network connectivity, there's a gigabit ethernet port, support for 802.11 AC Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The Triton 700 features a solid metal build, making it feel very premium. Both the lid and interior are the same matte black aluminium. The metal edges are a little sharp, but due to the lower keyboard placement, this wasn't really an issue while using it. The dimensions of the laptop are 39.4cm in width, 26.7cm in depth, and just under 1.9cm in height, so quite thin for a gaming laptop with these specs. Testing the weight, my unit came in just under 2.4 kilos. With the 230 watt power brick and cables for charging, the total weight increases to around 3.5 kilos. As mentioned, it's got a 15.6 inch 1080p 120Hz IPS panel with G-Sync. The viewing angles were good, colours looked clear to me on any angle, side to side or up and down. I've measured the current colour gamut using the Spider 5 Pro, and my results returned 97% of sRGB, 67% of NTSC, and 73% of Adobe RGB, so not too bad for a gaming laptop. At 100% brightness, I measured the panel at 286 nits in the centre, and with a 680 to 1 contrast ratio. Overall, I thought it looked pretty good while playing games. I've taken a long exposure photo in a dark room as a worst case backlight bleed test. It looked pretty good to my eyes, but the camera does pick up a little bleed, although this will vary between laptops anyway. The screen was fairly sturdy while trying to flex it, owing to the metal lid and hinges found out towards the far corners. It could also just be opened with one finger. It's got a fairly even weight distribution with the battery up the front, which helps weigh it down. Above the display in the centre is a 720p camera. I found both the camera and microphone fairly average in terms of quality, but you'll be able to judge both for yourself. As you've probably noticed by now, the keyboard is right down the front where the touchpad would usually be. By doing this, Acer are able to put all the heat generating components right up the back, keeping this area cool. The keyboard has individual key RGB backlighting, and there are a number of effects available through Acer's Predator Sense software. The lighting colour of the fan on the left hand side under the glass can also be customised through here too. The keyboard is apparently mechanical, and although it definitely sounds like one, it doesn't quite feel this way. To me, the keys felt a little strange as they bottomed out quickly. Here's how it sounds to give you an idea. There was minimal keyboard flex while pushing down fairly hard. It was quite sturdy thanks to the metal body. The touchpad is found in the centre of the glass, so right up the back. I found it pretty difficult to use, especially when swapping between it and the keyboard. It worked alright, but I'd definitely prefer to use a mouse. To the right hand side of the touchpad, there's also an air intake vent for the fan right below it. The two speakers are found towards the front left and right corners on either side of the keyboard. They sound pretty decent for laptop speakers. Quite clear to begin with, but at higher volumes the body of the laptop did make some vibration sounds. Speaking of sounds, like some other Acer laptops, it plays this sound on boot by default. Luckily, this can be disabled through the BIOS. For the I.O., on the left there's a Kensington lock, a USB 2.0 Type-A port hidden behind the square plastic cover, two USB 3 Type-A ports, and separate 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks. On the right there's the power button, USB Type-C Thunderbolt 3 port, third USB 3 Type-A port, and gigabit ethernet. The ethernet port did seem poorly placed to me. If you're right handed and using a mouse it can get in the way. On the back, there's a full-size display port and HDMI 2.0 output, 
as well as the power input and air exhaust vents towards the corners. There's nothing at all on the front, just smooth metal. On the back of the matte black metallic lid, there's the Predator logo in the center with a silver brushed finish. Fingerprints show up quite easily on the metallic interior, glass, and lid, but they're easy to wipe away as it's all smooth surfaces. Underneath there's some rubber feet, which did well at preventing sliding, as well as air intakes toward the back. The laptop can be opened up easily with the Phillips head screwdriver. Once the screws underneath are removed, the panel on top can be removed. Just be careful to remove the two ribbon cables that connect the keyboard to the motherboard. From left to right, we get easy access to the Wi-Fi card, two M.2 slots, which are covered with a metal heat spreader, the battery, and two memory slots. Powering the laptop is a 3-cell, 54Wh battery, and with a full charge and just watching YouTube videos with the screen on half brightness, keyboard lighting off, and background apps disabled, I was able to use it for 2 hours and 2 minutes. Although that was with G-Sync enabled. Even with G-Sync disabled however, the discrete Nvidia graphics were still in use. It didn't appear possible to make use of the integrated Intel graphics, which would probably last a lot longer. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the battery lasted for an hour longer, and was able to sit at 30 FPS the entire test without dipping. While gaming, battery life was alright, as that task makes use of the discrete graphics anyway, but outside of gaming, the overall battery life was fairly poor. Thermal testing was completed with an ambient room temperature of 19 degrees Celsius, so expect warmer temperatures in a warmer environment. Starting towards the bottom of the graph in light blue, at idle the CPU was actually quite warm, probably as the fan was running quietly, as you'll hear later. Moving up to gaming in the green bar, the temperatures were still acceptable, and this was after temperatures had stabilized from an hour of playing. After manually maxing out the fans in yellow, the CPU and GPU temperatures both dropped back a bit, with the CPU undervolted by minus 0.150 volts, but the fans back on default, the CPU temperature was a little cooler than by just maxing out the fans only, shown in orange. With the CPU undervolt and max fans combined, we get the best temperatures yet, shown in red. The stress tests were done by running ADA64 and the Heaven benchmark at the same time, in order to attempt to fully utilize both the processor and graphics. Moving up in the graph and starting with the dark red bar, the CPU peaked at 87. Honestly, not too bad for extended load, especially considering how thin the laptop is. By maxing out the fan and applying undervolting, shown in the pink, purple, and dark blue bars, the temperatures get significantly better. These are the average clock speeds for the same temperature tests just shown. Not really much to show here. As there was no thermal or power limit throttling, the 7700HQ was able to boost to its 3.4GHz all-core turbo speed without any problems, even in these stress tests. I've got some Cinebench CPU benchmarks here. I was getting the same results with or without the CPU undervolt applied. As shown earlier, there was no throttling at all here, so no problems getting full performance with the out-of-the-box configuration. Just for reference or comparison, I've also noted the score of the newer i5-8300H, the quad-core laptop CPU from the newer 8th generation. Although the performance doesn't change, the undervolt can still be used to drop the temperatures, as shown previously. Here are the GPU-only clock speeds while under a graphical-only stress test. Ace's Predator Sense software lets you apply GPU overclocks easily in two different levels known as faster and turbo. The faster profile overclocks the GPU core by 75MHz and the memory by 200MHz, while the turbo profile doubles this to 150MHz on the core and 400MHz on the memory. I was able to get a little further improvement by manually overclocking it with MSI Afterburner up to 200MHz on the core and 800MHz on the memory, as shown in red. But this may vary between laptops, as it depends on the particular chip. As for the external temperatures, where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle, the body was sitting in the low 30s, quite cool. While gaming, we can see that only the rear of the laptop warms up to around 50 degrees, as that's where the CPU and GPU are located. The keyboard area stays cool though. Fairly similar results with the stress tests running, and then with the fans manually maxed out and CPU undervolted, the external temperatures lower by a few degrees. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle, it was fairly quiet, and while gaming, it was about as loud as any other gaming laptop I've tested. Under stress test, this rose a little, and with the fans manually maxed out, it gets quite loud. 
you've got the option of controlling the fan speeds of the CPU or graphics independently through Acer's Predator Sense software. So that should help in finding a good balance between temperatures and fan noise. Overall, the temperatures and performance were pretty impressive when you consider the thin body of the laptop. I expected it to run hotter with the 1080 Max-Q graphics. But for the most part, the 7th gen CPUs seem to run cooler than the newer and faster 8th gen options. Finally, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. All games were run at 1080p with the latest Windows updates and these Nvidia drivers. Fortnite was tested using the replay feature, and it was performing very well even with max settings. Over 100 FPS on the averages, and the 1% lows aren't that terrible. While at lower settings, the 1% lows are around the refresh rate of the 120Hz panel, so it played very smoothly. Overwatch was tested playing in the training area, and again, very good frame rates at all setting levels. The game caps at 300 FPS, and we were able to reach this at low and medium settings, while ultra settings still resulted in 1% lows above the refresh rate of the panel, so again, very smooth gameplay. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the built-in benchmark. I've only just recently added this game to my testing, so I'm not too sure how well it compares to other spec laptops, but the frame rates look pretty good. PUBG was tested using the replay feature, and despite this being an unoptimized and poorly performing game, we're still able to average above 100 frames per second at ultra settings. Pretty good results, and still above 60 FPS for the 1% low. CSGO was tested using the Uletical benchmark, and the results are pretty decent in this test, well above 200 FPS even with all settings maxed out. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built-in benchmark, and even with ultra settings, the 1% lows are above the 120Hz refresh rate of the display, so even maxed out, it's running very well, perfectly smooth with no issues. Far Cry 5 was also tested with the built-in benchmark, and the results are fairly good for this specific test averaging above 60 FPS in terms of 1% lows at Ultra, which aren't too far behind the average frame rates, so the dips in performance aren't too low. Assassin's Creed Origins was another game that was tested with a built-in benchmark, and once more the frame rates in this game are pretty good. For comparison at Ultra, the averages are about 35% better than the Helios 300 that I recently tested. Dota 2 on the other hand was actually performing worse than the Helios 300, which I suspect is because it has a faster 8th gen CPU. In any case, these are the results with the Triton 700. Keep in mind, it's an intensive replay that does not represent real-world gameplay. This is a worst-case scenario test. Ghost Recon was tested with the built-in benchmark, and is another resource-demanding game. Still playable at ultra settings, but it was noticeably better at just about any other setting level. Watch Dogs 2 was also a pretty resource-demanding game, but it was running well even with ultra settings, averaging above 60 FPS although there wasn't much practical difference between ultra and high settings. The Witcher 3 was averaging around 100 FPS at ultra settings. It was running quite well, although the 1% low result was quite a bit lower, although this could be improved quite a bit by lowering the settings. I've got a few more games covered in the dedicated gaming benchmark video if you're interested. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley, and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy, and VRMark from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. Despite the Triton 700 featuring the slightly older Intel 7700HQ, which isn't even as good as the 8th gen i5 CPU, the results in all games tested are still very good, owing to the 1080 Max-Q graphics. The CPU is still pretty good for gaming in any case, but in most games, the graphics usually make a larger difference to performance, especially at higher settings or higher resolutions. Many games were able to get fairly high frame rates, a great combination for the 120Hz G-Sync display, which could actually be utilized well. As we saw earlier, we've got the option of overclocking the graphics, so let's see how this actually helps improve gaming performance. I didn't bother undervolting the CPU here, as there was no difference as no throttling was taking place. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the built-in benchmark, and at the highest settings, the overclocks were just getting us a small 6% performance improvement to the average frame rates. Fortnite was tested using the replay feature, and in this test, the overclocked results are slightly better, 8.5% faster than running at stock speeds when running maxed out at epic settings. So there was a little improvement with the GPU overclock applied, but it will vary between game and settings. As for storage, in Crystal Disk Mark, the 512GB RAID 0 array, which is made up of two M.2 NVMe SSDs, was performing quite well. Excellent read and write speeds. For updated pricing, you can check the links in the description. At the time of recording, here in Australia, this model goes for around 3800 Australian dollars, 
while in the US it goes for around $2600 US dollars. Compared to other thin and light laptops, it's about the same price of the Razer Blade, which has a new 8th gen CPU, although slightly lower 1070 Max-Q graphics. Either way, not cheap. So what do you guys think about the Acer Predator Triton 700? Overall, it's a very nice gaming laptop. Quite thin and powerful specs, although this combination is always associated with a higher price. Despite the thinner body, there was absolutely no throttling of any kind in any of my tests, and it performed well in all games tested, especially when combined with the 120Hz display with G-Sync. The only things I personally didn't like was the lower battery life outside of gaming, low profile mechanical key switches, and the strange placement of the touchpad. I get that the design keeps the heat up the back, but I found it difficult to use. I'd always want to stick to using a proper mouse. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments, and leave a like to let me know if you found the review useful. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for future tech videos like this one.